Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us for the launch of Dignity and Dine Scotland's election candidates campaign. I'm Ali Thompson, the director for Dignity and Dine Scotland, and I'm delighted um, to be able to introduce you to a fantastic panel of speakers today. Uh, I'll come on to that in a minute, but first I've got to run through some very quick housekeeping points. So the event should last for around an hour and a half. We're so delighted that so many people have been able to join us, but unfortunately that means that we can't see or hear you, but please do get involved by posing your questions by using the Q&A function. There should be a button on your screen somewhere. Ask a question at any time. Tell us who you are and why assisted dying matters to you. But if possible, so we can get through as many questions as we can, please be brief. Lastly, we're recording the event um, for those who can make it today but are very interested. And we've had a number of people ask if um, they can be sent afterwards. I mentioned we had an excellent panel of speakers. We will hear um, from Peter Duncan from Message Matters, from Thora, Sarah and Zoe about their fantastic mum, Heather Black. Um, firstly, and uh, this is what you call a really good day at work, I am delighted to introduce you to our special guest speaker, who probably needs not very much of an introduction, but I'll tell you she's a chef, a writer, a TV presenter, Great British Bake Off judge, um, Chancellor of Queen Margaret University in Edinburgh, and also a patron of Dignity and Dying. I'm going to hand you over now to Prue Leaf. Thank you. Um, I joined Dignity and Dying after my brother David died of bone cancer. Bone cancer doesn't kill you, it just hurts like hell and your bones become so fragile that coughing can break a rib. You have to wait for the disease to spread to an organ, which when it, when it finally does fail, that will kill you. Or you can hope for the old man's friend pneumonia to finish you off. Either way, you should not surely have to endure months of pain and agony. Of course, many hospice, hospices, many hospices and a few hospitals do manage a patient's death with compassion and enough morphine to kill the pain, but most do not. Sometimes it is just not possible to alleviate the pain, even with the strongest drugs, but more often doctors don't dare raise the morphine dose for fear that the patient will die and they will be accused of murder or mercy killing. You've more chance of a good death in a hospice. Their aim is to aid a peaceful death rather than keep a patient alive, however much suffering that causes. In our parents' day, doctors would give their dying patients enough drugs to relieve the pain. If it helped them on their way, well, nobody thought that was wrong. David was given morphine. The blessed relief would last three hours, but the nurses were, would be unable to give him his next dose for another hour. So out of every four hours, one of them would be spent in groaning, crying, sometimes begging agony. You wouldn't treat a dog like that. If you did, the RSPCA would rightly accuse you of willful cruelty and neglect. Um, in the months of David's pattern, a pa in the months of the, of the day of David's dying, a pattern developed. He would get pneumonia, he'd be admitted to hospital, they would give him antibiotics, he would recover from the pneumonia and he'd be sent home. And a week or two later, he'd get another infection and be admitted again. With only a fortnight or so to go, David's wife discharged him because David desperately wanted to die at home. Their four children came to be with him, and there were some good times. When the morphine was doing its job, David would be pain-free, surrounded by his family, joking, or, which was very unusual for him, telling them just how much they had enriched his life and how much he loved them. That is how dying should be. But those moments were rare. The drug regime, still under the hospital consultant, remained the same while he was at home. Those four children, 
and beloved wife's memories should be of the good times, but they are overlaid by the memories of David's one hour in four of agony and their anguish and their helplessness and inability to help. Two of my nieces, separately and unknown to each other, pleaded with the agency nurses who came to administer the drugs to increase the morphine dose. One replied, if you knew how often we are asked that, we would willingly do it. All over the country, in and out of hospitals, people are dying and suffering just like your dad. It's so unnecessary and no one admits it's happening. David's wife and children took turns with him to, to be with him night and day. One said to me that she'd sat for half an hour with a pillow in her hands, trying to stick her courage to the sticking point, but she could not bring herself to suffocate her own dad. In the end, David, determined to die, refused any more antibiotics, so allowing the next dose of pneumonia to kill him. Dying of pneumonia is a horrible death. Basically, you drown slowly and painfully as your lungs fill with mucus and you cannot breathe. David's family had to endure the sound of labored breathing, then for the last five days of a constant loud death rattle. They had to bear the sight of their father and husband, thick green discharge running from mouth and nose, veering from excruciating pain to semi-coma. Death is always distressing, but in this day and age, with all our talk of respect and consideration for others, how can it be that a wife ends up praying for her husband to please, please just die? Had a sister dying been legal, David could have been given enough morphine to keep the pain away and allow those last months to be satisfying and rewarding for the family and as pleasant as possible. But when he was ready, and when he was ready, he could have said goodbye and had a decent, dignified death with a legally prescribed overdose. How can that be wrong? I really hope that every candidate in the May 6th election will treat this as a priority and declare now that should they be elected, they will press for a change in the law so that their dying constituents and all Scots can have as painless and dignified a death as possible at a place, at a time, and in a manner of their choosing, and are not driven, as so many dying people are today, to making the sad and expensive journey to Dignitas, alone if they want to prevent their spouse being charged with assisting their suicide, or be driven to attempted suicide at home. How can we have a law that allows a citizen to take their own life, but not get medical help to do it safely and painlessly? 87% of the Scottish public want to see a change in the law. This doesn't surprise me. No one surely faced with their own death wants to die as my brother did. Australia, New Zealand, Canada, many states in the US have already legislated assisted dying. It's high time the UK did. And I'm trusting Scotland to lead the way. Thank you. Thanks so much, Prue. I hope we don't let you down. Um, that was incredibly uh, moving and motivating. And you can read a bit more about um, Prue and David in today's daily record. Um, like Prue's brother, David, at Dignity and Dying Scotland, we work with people who really um, want and who need assisted dying to be legalised. I've personally promised to take their stories to the decision makers who have the power to make this happen and to keep the issue really high on the public and political agenda and we're holding true to that promise today as we launch a national advertising campaign which urges candidates standing for the Scottish Parliament elections to back changing the law. People across the country both with a terminal illness and those who've watched a loved one suffer a bad day are standing up and speaking out and they're sending a clear message to the parliamentary candidates that change must come. We're going to quickly show you the adverts that are going live uh, from yesterday. I won't read them all out because there's, uh, there's obviously people's stories and, and a lot of um, 
story there, but if you keep an eye out for them, they'll be coming to a newspaper very near you. Here we've got Chris. Um, Chris is a retired physicist from Edinburgh who's been successfully treated for throat cancer, but knows should the time come uh, what he would want, and that's a dignified, peaceful death at home. We have Tracy, who I believe is joining us today. Um, like Prue, Tracy has spoken with the, the Daily Record to tell them why assisted dying is so important for her. Um, Tracy lives in Ayrshire and has a terminal cancer diagnosis, and she's making the appeal to the election candidates to change the law so she doesn't have to contemplate taking her own life at home. And Norma, um, Norma is also in Ayrshire by, by sheer coincidence. And Norma has witnessed very bad deaths in her own family. She too has terminal cancer and doesn't want her children and her grandchildren to go through the painful experience she did watching her loved ones die. Paula's mum, Margaret, died of brain cancer. And in the final months of her life, she contemplated going to Switzerland um, and also going to a hotel room to work out how to end her own life with the, the least amount of mess and fuss and the fewest implications for her family. And uh, Paula feels very strongly that the last few months of her mum's life could have been so, so much better, so much more uh, about making memories and enjoying the time she had rather than contemplating a, a lonely and painful death. And Josh is speaking up on behalf of his grandmother, Mary, who stopped eating and drinking in order to um, hasten her death. The family were told it would take four days and um, Mary survived without any food or fluid for 13 agonising and seemingly endless days. And um, our next speakers, Tora, Sarah and Victoria, uh, feature in this lovely advert here in memory of their mum, Heather Black. Sarah, Tora and Zoe have really picked up the campaigning baton from and for their mum. They've told Heather's story in a really phenomenally powerful interview in the Scotland and Sons last year. They told about how Heather was a pioneering campaigner and by, by their account, a force of nature. They also told about the horrific death they had to witness and how they wished it could be different. And I'm delighted that they're with us today to talk about their work to change the law in Heather's memory. I'll hand over now. Hi guys, um, well I'll just go, go for it. <laughs> okay, so um, in terms of the, the campaign um, for assisted dying, we've done, um, you know, we've contacted our MPs, we've had a meeting with uh, Ben McPherson, our local MP, we've shared um, lots on social media, Twitter and stuff, um, we did an interview um, with Danny Garbov of the Scotsman, um, just at the tail end of the last year, I think it was. And also we are um, involved in the campaign um, in the, the different newspapers this week. So, yeah, I mean, we're just keen to, to do everything that we can, um, not only just in memory of our mum, but for everybody's loved ones. Um, and our listening to Prue there, um, it was just exactly like how it was for my mum and for Prue's brother there as well. So the law needs to be to be changed and you know I think I think it will happen. Um, and I hope it's sooner rather than later um, for it for everybody because it's as Prue said it's 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 your right. It's a human right, you know, to to die in a in a more dignified way, peaceful and with your family round about you. Um, our mum was strong-minded, very strong-minded, and she knew that four, I would say probably four days before she actually died, 
she asked us um, to, to help her die. And, you know, we thought about, like, Prue's nieces to put a pillow over her face and stuff, and we couldn't do it, but we wished that we had the, the courage to do it because the, the, ne the next four days were, they were just horrific. They were really horrific. Um, I don't know, Sarah, do you want to say anything? Thank you, Tora. <laughs> um, yeah, I think, I think for us, um, it's important to say that, you know, we've had a lot of terminal illness in our family, whether it's kind of cancer, HIV, you know, through my mum's work, you know, we've, we've seen a lot of, a lot of death and a lot of terminal illness. But I think the kind of the situation that my mum was in was just so different and so brutal and so kind of horrific and you know like Prue touched on my mum had esophagus um, cancer she had a, a, a huge tumour um, in her esophagus and she literally brought that tumour up over her last 24 hours so we wiped the tumour from her um, for those last days and I think that what was really, really difficult was that the person that was in the bed these last four days didn't resemble my mum. She had turned into, she, her whole body just, it's hard to describe. She just went so small and so twisted. And that last night, when the tumour was coming from her, it was like brown foam stuff coming out our mouth we we literally had to uh, use sheets towels pillowcases anything we could get our hands on to to wipe it the smell was horrendous we, we actually had tea towels wrapped around our face because the smell was so bad we were but i was never i could never have known that people that the smell would come and that she, the, the, and the noise as well, like the, like Prue said, the noise was unreal. She literally choked, like choked, made a choking noise for the last like 24 hours, maybe even more. You know, we my mum got her cancer diagnosis on the 6th of May last year and she, uh, 6th of March um, last year yeah. and she died on the 14th of May. So we had 10 weeks and pretty much sort of from her diagnosis, um, she had a stent fitted to try and widen her gullet because she couldn't eat. But what what happened, you know, she, she deteriorated pretty rapidly and she was sleeping probably for about sort of 20, 21 hours a day. So Zoe luckily lived next door to her. So she would say, you know, mum's up and we would do kind of round the clock care between the, between the three of us. And, you know, and most of the time she was sleeping. But when we got to that end stage, she... Oh, <laughs> there was a change in her and she was ready to die and she was able to say to the hospice staff she, she couldn't go into a hospice because of um because of covid you had to choose two visitors and my mum refused to choose between the three of us so we decided to keep, keep her at home um but she was ready she knew that she, there was no point in keeping her alive for for that part of um, you know, just to go through that horror, she said goodbye to her, our kids, and she knew that that was time, and that's your right. She fought for so many people in her life. She was an amazing person, a pioneer. She she changed policy. She she created the third sector of charities, and you know, it doesn't matter. Even kind of like who she was or the fact that she had helped so many people in her life. It doesn't matter who you are. It's your basic right to be able to choose to die on your own terms. And if you don't want to do that, if you want to live a, a life and, and have the, the possibility of a barbaric death, that's your choice. But you shouldn't take that away from people. Um, that, that, that's a human right. You should be able to say that I want to die on my own terms. And she was ready. She was of sound mind. She had a terminal illness and she could, she, she said, I've had enough. She was so scared. And her mum was feisty. She was a, a feisty wee character. She was really strong. And she cried so much that, that, that last part. And to see and never, our mum scared, cry. frightened, in fear, traumatised, and also her knowing what we were going through was also awful for her. So as a kind of, as a sort of 
perfect storm of us and her together, knowing the pain that, that was being caused that was totally unnecessary, really, really needs to change. And I think just one one thing, I think we, in the, the four days, we never, we never imagined it would get so bad. And every time we thought this is bad, it got worse. And nobody should ever have to, to nurse their, their loved one in that, in that situation. It was just absolutely horrific. And can I also so say that we were never told that the body would, wouldn't give up. So when that last night, my mum's lungs would start stop breathing and then her heart would kick in. And my mum went from grey to purple. She was every colour under the sun. Her veins were popping out. Her eyes were popping because her heart was trying to, to keep going. So as her heart was going, her lungs were failing and then vice versa. And then it was the most bizarre thing. I've never known a human body to go through so many changes. She would red one day, she, one minute. She was all blotchy. Um, like the uh, veins on her hands, what we witnessed. Was and I think, I think Sarah, you, you sort of made the point, like who, who are we actually keeping these, you know, the, our loved ones alive for? Like we, you wouldn't do that to an animal. You would, you would just, you would take it to the vet and in a humane way, you would, you would, you would put, put the animal down. So who are we actually, and th then you've got the, the actual um, the finance, the, the amount of money, the, the amount of drugs that my mum had in the last four days. Why? I, I, wanna, I can't get my head around it at all. It's just so unnecessary. Yeah, I think as Prue touched on as well, you know, like the kind of the up in the morphine and that the timing thing, you know, obviously we, 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 you know, we had the kind of the added complication of, of COVID and, you know, having to phone people, people coming in bloody suited up. You know to, to kind of administer more drugs um and you know she ended up she had uh um a line in her arm a line in both arms Did one in her belly and one in her leg, leg so she they were basically pumping it in from like every space and she was she's tiny oh. Um, and they said that you know it was a, they had never administered that many drugs in a in a community situation. And the person in the the hospice, when we spoke to them after, they said that they could not believe the amount of um, of drugs that had been pumped into my mum. And the, I was kind of going to make this point before about her sleeping sort of twenty twenty one sort of twenty two hours a day. When we had that conversation on the Sunday. Where, where she had had enough, she was ready to die. And we decided collectively to start the end of life meds then. That was a decision that was made with her, with the hospice staff. From that point, that was when it got, I mean, if it wasn't bad, that's when it got really horrific. Like with the three of us, we didn't sleep from the Sunday to the Thursday. We were catching like an hour here and there. She was literally awake, possessed, like, it, it just it was like they were pumping you know like I don't know I don't know what it would at be at one point my mum would be unconscious and then in a split second she would be trying to get out the bed and she would be like clawing at us and and getting her leg out the bed and trying to rise and then she'd be exhausted and lie back and then before we knew it she was like she was possessed again and she would be like we, at what one about? point she turned right round in the bed and we're like yeah. Where is she so those that palliative care and those end of life meds, Rubbish. they they don't yeah. always work. And I kind of sorry, I jumping around, but as I touched on, you know, we've we've dealt. Our stepdad had um, two brain tumors. He had like you know three operations in his brain. He had osteoporosis. You know, we've we've dealt with death. We've dealt with people who have died. Um, but nothing like this and nothing when you know my mum always joked that you know she had the tablets in the in the drawer or you know that she was going to end her life on her terms and you know she was so kind of like feisty about it like I'm going to go out on you know on, on my own terms and we just couldn't do that for her and she begged us apps begged us to kill her and to end our life and end our suffering and we we just couldn't do it um and that's not right and it needs to change Absolutely. Um, she sounds just the most amazing person and I can't thank you enough for um, going over that very, very hard time of your life and, you, and your mum's death again. 
Um, I think it, it, it's maybe really obvious how complex a grief you're left with when you've watched somebody die such a bad death and have those terrible kind of conflicting feelings of wanting not for them to be gone, but for the pain to be over. And can I What's just say really that? remarkable yeah. is the way in which um, I, I think as a, a legacy of who your mum was and her pioneering campaigning, you've taken such a very personal experience and looked for how you can make political change so that nobody needs to, needs to experience anything like as awful as, as you did and as Heather did. We're going to take a little look now um, at that political process and, and the, the process that you've all been such a part of in terms of speaking to decision makers about why this really matters and what really happens, what really can happen out there. Um, it's exactly one month today to the Scottish Parliament elections. And I'm going to hand over now to Peter Duncan, who works with us in the campaign. Peter is a director of political consultancy, Message Matters. He spent a bit of time himself on the House of Commons benches, and he's a regular contributor to Scottish political discussions. Really pleased to have him along today. Peter, could you tell us a little bit about how things are looking Holyrood wise? Hi Ali, and uh, thanks very much. For, I'm very happy to do that, and um, uh, I'm tempted to follow that because it's uh, very difficult um, to know how to follow that uh, testimony for uh, from Tora, Sierra, and Zoe. Um, but I'll, say I'll, I'll I'll try and do that because I know that you know the three of you are so immensely focused on delivering a successful outcome to this campaign. So. Um, I suppose that's my job. Um, have, you having demonstrated the why is perhaps to explain a little bit about the how uh, as, and explain how it's going. I mean, for all sorts of reasons, not least of all the number of people who have had um, difficult, horrendous experiences um, like like yours. Um, there, this is now an issue in the headlights of politicians. Um, it has been already, it is fair to say. Um, there have been two, there have already in the Scottish Parliament been two attempts to change the law on, uh, on assisted dying, most recently in 2015. And when we started um, working with Ali um, and Dignity in Dying, it was, it was our assessment at that point, which was kind of the middle of the Parliament that's just finishing, that, um, that we weren't yet in a position where another attempt would have been successful. And I think it's a, it's a testimony to the way in which the dial has moved in that um, a, you know, two or three period, two or three year period since um, through the work of uh, Dignity, Dignity and Dying and others that um, you know, I'm, I'm now really hopeful about where we now stand. Um, the election is, <clears throat> as Prue ref, uh, referred to is on May the 6th and you'll know that you know, I'm sure you've started to be aware of the heightening of the political coverage on, on the media and so on. But it, it's, a, it's a pivotal opportunity to change the, the makeup of the Scottish Parliament. I don't mean from a party uh, composition point of view, because arguably this is an issue that transcends party politics. It's about individual conviction and individual um, understanding. <clears throat> what we're seeing, though, is we're seeing a big uh, exodus uh, from Parliament for of over 35 MSPs who have been there for a long time, and they will inevitably be replaced by um, new candidates uh, who are new to the Parliament. And our job is to set the, the backdrop and the groundwork in place such that early in the next Parliament, so in, over the next uh, year or so, we're able to get the parliament in a position whereby we start to get a uh, majority support uh, for legislative change. I, I think it was I think it was Prue that, that uh, referred to that uh, quite striking figure of 87% of the Scottish public believing that legislative change is, is required. Um, and, and that's a very powerful number. Um, your, your task and our task working together is to convey the strength of, of that feeling to, to candidates across this um, election. Um, I'm often, often asked, you know, in, in this campaign and, and in others uh, like them, is how, how can we make the biggest difference? You know, what is it that's most powerful? Um, you know, what, what creates the best possible impression with the aspiring candidate? 
and the the, the absolute the fundamentals are unchanged. You know, political campaigning is changing a lot, but the thing which absolutely makes the biggest difference is one person going in front of someone who is seeking elected office or who has just got elected office, telling them their story, telling them why it's important to them. And, and seeking to explain the reason for their, their for, for the change they want to make. For all of the uh, social media and the, the, the broadcast coverage or whatever, and admittedly COVID makes things difficult, but it is still that one-to-one -one relationship that makes the most powerful thing that any any politician can face. So if you if you can, um, you know, you can make a real difference by handwriting a letter and sending it to your elected representative. I always found this, admittedly it was a few years ago now, but that power, that, the power that's conveyed by someone writing in their own hand and saying, this is my story, this is why I think it's important, is a really powerful thing for a, a candidate or elected representative to do. Or, or contact their, their campaign office, they will want to speak to you. Obviously, COVID makes it difficult for cover campaigning on the doorstep just now, but they are really keen to speak to members of the electorate and their constituencies and all candidates. If you ask to speak to them on the telephone or on the, on the video call or whatever, they will absolutely come back to you and their offices will make that uh, gesture. So anything you can do to get, if you like, from this big national campaign that's going on in the background, anything you can do to bring that conversation to a one-to-one -one, uh, discussion on the merits of bringing an end to the bad deaths that we've heard of from Sarah, Zoe and Tora uh, and Prue, that's the most powerful. And, and importantly, when you hear from a candidate and you ever get an expression of support, or, a, or a, a confirmation that the candidate is not going to support the campaign, please feed that back to, to Ali and our team and Dignity and Dying. We are absolutely maintaining, sounds very spooky, some sort of James Bond mystical figure in the background, but we have a big, big spreadsheet where we're maintaining uh, 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 pledges of support. And what's really important is when you get that feedback from an individual candidate or an elected representative, is let us know so we can factor that into um, uh, to our consideration and our planning. One final thing, because uh, I know there's questions coming in, Ali, you want to take one final thing. It, it, in my experience, it, it's it's fun. It's changing your mind on a subject is not a black and white issue. It's not the case that someone is resolutely opposed to an issue and one intervention it very rarely means that you make someone completely change their mind on an issue. What, you, what happens is people go on, as they say, they go on a journey. They, they I have a particular opinion and then gradually that opinion softens a bit and then gradually they become quite neutral on the issue and then gradually they're persuaded to support. So whether or not your elected representatives or your candidates, um, um, are, to what degree they are opposed or whether they are supportive, it's absolutely important that the contacts are maintained because each of them the power which that comes over in these stories, each of them will start to move the dial in the right direction. Um, and uh, you know, I think I know you're doing fantastic work out there and contacting your local candidates. All I can say um, in helping a campaign is is keep it up. It's it's really important. Um, I think uh, the time is is now right. If you look at the international movements, there's a sense of momentum around the world that this is the next real social change that's coming. Um, I, I, I think just keep it up and we very early in this coming parliament, I'm sure, can get a bill coming forward for making plan, distinct and direct plans for that now. Um, and we then just need to get the right um, elected representatives supporting it and giving it their, their credibility behind the campaign. So I'm really optimistic. It's a, it's a horrendous subject. It's a terribly... Um, challenging social issue, big issue for our, for our age, but I think it's one the next Scottish Parliament's going to fix, and I'm looking forward to playing my part. Thanks so much, Peter, and thanks for setting the homework assignment there um, to everybody to contact the candidates and to let us know 
what they they tell you back in response. And Peter touched on a couple of things, and one of those was that this um, this campaign is really that it's Scotland's next most progressive human rights reform, and it's really really urgent that Scotland follows progressive parliaments around the world who have already legislated for safe and compassionate assisted dying. As part of the campaign, we've compiled a, a very, very, very short little film to tell you a bit more about those places. And my colleague Francis should be ready to play that now. It's just a minute. The end of life choice referendum has been won. 65.2%. I shouldn't stand in the way of other people's choice on that. You know, I know there are strongly held views, but my view is that actually we remove the thing that's blocking people from being able to um, follow their own personal beliefs. Lung cancer is an ugly way to die. I would find great comfort in knowing that I had another option, that I might choose to be done with cancer before cancer is done with me. Thank you. So a huge thanks to all of our speakers today. We are going to be putting the questions to them very shortly. One thing that's been touched on by several of us is that 87% of Scots are in favour of assisted dying. And that's because they know that the current situation is broken and unsustainable in the ways that we've heard it about today. As well as excellent palliative care, excellent care at the end of life. Dying people also need the voice and the tools to let them have the death that's right for them. And none of the current alternatives that the people taking part in our advertising campaign talk about, whether it's Switzerland, starvation, taking your own life or suffering, are in any way acceptable alternatives to a safe and compassionate law. I'm going to echo Peter now and say it's just so important that we let our candidates for the Scottish Parliament know this now, because in the next session of the Scottish Parliament, they will be asked to vote for change. We've been working with our partner organisations, Friends at the End and the Humanist Society Scotland, and a group of really interested MSPs in the Parliament to bring about a new bill to the, the floor, the debating chamber of Holyrood. The bill will be both compassionate and safe, and it will seek to legalise assisted dying for terminally ill and mentally competent adults. I think its chances of passing are phenomenally high, partly because so many people say to me that what, once we've done this, we're going to look back, history is going to judge us. They're going to look back and people are going to wonder why we didn't act sooner. Why we let this suffering go on, suffering like we've heard about today for so long. And it's true. When we look back, we can see that people have had to join together to really fight for so many rights that just seem obvious to us now. And every person speaking today, joining today, every person who speaks up, who contacts their candidates, is part of this growing movement for change. And as we emerge from the pandemic, there's never been a better time to change how we die. We will change the law. We'll do it together as a movement. Thank you so much for being here today and part of the movement. It's one whose time has certainly come. And on that, we'll hand over to the questions uh, part of the event. We've got 20 minutes, so we'll see. Um, 
of what we've got coming through. We've got lots of questions coming in. Um, and also, can I just say to um, Prue, to Sarah, Tora and Victoria, we've got so many people saying um, how poignant and moving and um, how meaningful they find your stories about um, your brother Prue and your mum, um, Sarah, Tora and Zoe. And one of the questions to, um, to, to you all is, how would your final memories of your mum be different if she could have had an assisted death? I'll hand over to Zoe, Sarah and Tora. Zoe, you're on mute. <laughs> okay. There she goes. Well, my mum died 10 feet away through that wall. Um, so I have the horror of every time I go in my garden and look at my mum's garden and look, in her win look at her window and the new people living there. I think that when, when my mum eventually died, when other people in her family had died, we always spent that time after death being, being with them, for, sometimes for many hours afterwards. But what happened with us was we decided to get the um, funeral director to come and take my mum away as soon as possible because of the horrors that we had actually witnessed by the time my mum actually did die and she wasn't even look like the, my mum. She, she, she just wasn't that. So we assisted dying. I feel that we would have had a more calm we would have been able to say goodbye to her. We would have been able to look at her, cuddle her and, and hold her hand and, and stuff like that. No be horrified at what actually did happen these, this, these, that, that last week. Um, it went on far too long. Um, and I think with assisted dying, it would have been calm and it would have been dignified. And humane. And and humane and we would have been I think we would maybe be able to cope better I don't I don't know yeah. if that's true but what no we saying witnessed it. Mm -hmm. okay yeah you're 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 not saying it was it was going to be easy it was going to be still heartbreaking um so bad but we could have you know sat with our played our favorite music had the kids coming in maybe to say goodbye telling funny stories just it would have been so, so much, so different. It was just, I mean, I don't think we would have been using the words like horrific and stuff had we been able to fulfil our wishes, the dying on that, that sort of, probably the Sunday, which was four days before. Um, and I think we wouldn't have felt so guilty had she died the way that she wanted to, to die. So we've got all that guilt that she went through all that totally unnecessary yeah. yeah and I think we just we probably never got a chance to say a proper goodbye because we didn't know when it was going to happen so we never we never you know got that movie goodbye um you know where you hold someone's hand and they gently you know gently pass away and and we have been lucky enough with other people who have died in our life that we have been there at the end of life and it has you know it has been like the the movies and you've you've been able to say goodbye but I think we we just we never got that chance because it was it was just one horror after another and even in terms of when to bring the kids in when for when to let them say their goodbyes so it just you know and I'm a planning what? and logistics person as you said Ali, earlier Ali so you know you you want to have a you know you want to not be able plan, to do but... that and uh, not a plan but you, you know her friends or you know other people in our in our lives you know when's the right time for them to come in and it kind of it kind of escalated pretty quickly to a point where it was just us because it was so bad mm -hmm. so yeah. you know so she, uh, other people in our life didn't get a chance to say goodbye either yeah oh, so sorry Thank and you. obviously COVID, COVID played a big part in that as well and um, you know people weren't able to come in um, as they normally would have to say their goodbye so just all, all of that just added to the yeah that was all taken away from us it really was because we had to deal with that the, in the moment, what was happening right now? Uh, my mum choking and and 
and and basically starving to death as well. So. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you so much um, for, for such a moving answer. I think we can see that if your mum had been able to have the choice of an assisted death, it would have been not just so different for how she died, but for how you all grieved afterwards and for the whole bereavement journey. Um, I, I maybe should have said when I was introducing you that I know it's um, around about a year since um, Heather died. And so this is an exceptionally poignant time, that first anniversary, and it must be so very much on your minds just now. We've got a question um, for Prue next from someone who read the interview today, and they're keen to know how hard it is to share the story of, of your loved one about your, to tell people about what happened to your brother, and if you've got any advice for anybody who's looking to share their story. Oh, I think you're on mute, Pierre. Dude, somewhere. There we go. Uh, sorry about that. Um, I haven't found it difficult at all. In fact, I've wanted to do it because I'm I'm I am a bit of a bossy woman, and I tend to sort of interfere with things when I don't think they're right. And so I've been involved in, in quite a few um, charities and campaigns and things trying to improve stuff. But um, so I haven't found it difficult. What um, I think it has been much more difficult for my brother's immediate family, his wife and, and children, because they see publicity and, and they, they're reminded over and over again of, of the horrors of that. And, and that previous question was interesting about what would, his, what would our memories have been like if we could have had a sister dying. And I know very well that our memories of David would have been um, as he was before he was ill, which was, he, and even when he was just a bit ill, you know, before it became bad, he was very, um, um, how can I say, he, he, he loved joking, he was, quite politically incorrect, but he was very funny. And he could be relied on to be um, not the life and soul of a party, but he would just have this dry sense of humor. And, and people would remember that. But what actually they remember is the end. The, you know, that's, it's the overlay of the bad memories that should not have been made on top. And I think they're all still traumatized. I speak to my sister-in-law quite often, and she she still remembers with guilt that she could not do anything for him. I was his wife. Why couldn't I have helped him? Why wasn't I stronger? Why didn't I make the doctors give him more morphine? Why, you know, she couldn't do any of this. None of this is her fault, but she's left feeling guilty. And, um, you know, the, the daughter who who'd failed to suffocate him feels that she should have done it. And why didn't she do it? I think they'll live with that all their lives. Anyway, we shouldn't create these horrible memories. We should do our best to make the end of life. I mean, it's never going to be great, is it? I mean, nobody wants to, their loved ones to die, but you know, we should aim at that, what everybody wants, which is, mo well, most people want, not everybody, a few people want to die alone, but most people want to die with their loved ones around them in the movie manner, somebody holding their hand, Maybe, you know, just dignified is the point. Absolutely. Thanks very much, Prue. Um, I completely agree about th that overlaying of the memories. What you remember is the, the, the illness rather than the person. And, and um, it would be great to, to do something that, that helps people change that in the future. Peter, quick question for you on the political process. Um, We've got someone here saying that they have loads of regional candidates um, as well as their constituency candidates. Should they contact all candidates or um, just the constituency? Um, it, it's a good question. Uh, it, it, the Scottish Parliament, as you probably know, has, has uh, a system which combines uh, candidates who are elected for the constituency and those who are uh, elected for, for the list. 
as far as proceedings in the Parliament is concerned, they are identical. They both have it, will have exactly the same <clears throat> ability to influence the, leg, the, cha the legislation when it comes forward. So we would certainly very much uh, want to encourage you to contact regional candidates as well. Um, uh, one, one, there are some, there are particular regional candidates that are more likely to be elected than most. And it might be if you want to drop a DID a, a, a line later on. We will send we'll send you a list of some of some of those in your area that we're particularly interested in hearing about. Great, thank you. Um, there's one that I'm going to tackle now, and that's that we've heard back from candidates who are particularly concerned about safeguards. This is really timely because I had um, a response back from a candidate this morning saying. I really want to support this. In principle, I agree with it, but I'm really worried about how we make it safe. Um, how do we convince MSPs that a change in the law is safe? So I would point to the key safeguards in the, the forthcoming bill, which is that someone must have a terminal illness and be mentally competent in order to be eligible for an assisted death. We can also point to the international evidence from places such as Oregon, who had a law in place since the late 90s, and show how the law works there, and that actually it protects vulnerable people, because at its core is transparency and fairness and empowerment. And anybody concerned about safety um, must see that these are the things that lead to safety, rather than what we currently have, which is driving some deaths underground or overseas um, in a very untransparent way. One of the, the kind of key points I would say back is that the bill that we are proposing will make things more safe. And the, the key safeguarding criteria, terminal illness, mental capacity, it works elsewhere and through transparency and empowerment is how we guarantee that. Uh, We've got time for just another few before we, we need to stop. Um, what is the timeline for law change? What will the process through Hollywood look like? Um, it's a bit, I think Peter can back me up on this. It's a bit of a movable feast. Um, the first stage of any bill in the Scottish Parliament is a public consultation. And it's the public consultation that we are working to launch now very early in the new Parliament. We will get that um, lodged once, once we can. That will go, um, we'll be contacting you again to ask you to respond to that consultation. And then the process of um, taking the bill through the Parliament comes on the back of that. Peter, is there anything you'd like to add? Yeah, I think that, that's, that's right. Um, I, mean, I think the... Um, we're we're now in the well, let's say let's say the middle of uh, 2021. Uh, by the time the Parliament returns, <clears throat> I think it's more likely to um, because there's three stages of parliamentary process to come beyond the consultation. So I think those three stages are probably likely to play out over the course of 2022. That would be um, a reasonable. Um, expectation and perhaps um, so I would think in your own mind you should be thinking about the first half of this next parliament as being the, the decisive one um, as far as uh, getting to the point of a final decision. Wonderful and our last question today is um, it's been asked to prove but um, it's such a good question I'm actually going to open it up to all our panellists starting with Prue. And that is, what would you say to the party leaders in Scotland if they were in front of you right now? So I'll hand that one to Prue first. I think the most important thing we should I think, am I, am I muted or unmuted? Can you hear me? Yeah. Nope, you're good. We can hear you. Okay. I think I'd say to all candidates is that they just need to take the time to read the evidence and to think about their own death. If you ask people what sort of death they like, they describe the one that Zoe, I think, talked of as being a, a movie death. And it, it involves um, peacefulness, um, comfort, love, um, companionship, friends or family, um, and, and certainty. 
And I think that what we need to them to do is to take the tr trouble to look at all that. I think most people would rather not talk about death. And um, members of parliament are no different. They don't, want to, they don't want to think about this thing. And they have a duty to think about it. And they're going to have to think about it because it's going to come before the Scottish, Scottish Parliament. What we don't want is, is them to turn up not having um, read about it. I mean, not having studied it. And it, it, you don't have to study a lot. You only have to listen to those three girls and you'll have to find very good reasons to want to keep the present law. All we want is them for them to agree to um, for the law to be changed. We don't need them to say now exactly how the law could be changed because experts like Dignity and Dying and all the rest will, will, will put that together. All they need to do is to recognize how lousy the law is at the moment. Fantastic, thank you. Peter, your message to the party leaders on assisted dying. Yeah, I, I think um, I endorse everything that Prue said. I think I think listen to the public is a good message. You know, I, this is not this is no longer um, um, an issue of marginal concerns. There's something which is the absolute central, you know, um, belief um, of the Scottish public. And also, I think as far as the the legislation is concerned, is 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 think carefully about the reassurance that that can be provided by the safeguarding system that's going to be proposed, because I think many of the concerns that have been in place before are fundamentally uh, um, uh, reassure reassurances provided by the safeguards that we're going to propose. So I think if if you put those two together, the public are behind this. And we can provide a safeguarding system that prevents the system being abused. I think that is a compelling combination for elected representatives. Fantastic. Thanks, Peter. And and Sarah, what message in front of you right now? Um, I think just really what Prue and um well, I can't remember his name, John. Peter, Peter, sorry, Peter. Um, yeah, what they've just said that, you know, to say that it could be abused is no good enough reason for our loved ones to die in the way that, that, they, that they are dying and they're going to continue to die unless the law is changed. We're talking about someone that's sound mind, that's mentally, uh, sorry, terminally ill. They're, you know, they're at the end of their life. Nothing's going to get better. So why are we keeping these people alive and just, just, uh, it has to, the law has to be changed so that we have the right and the choice at the end of our life, like we do throughout our life, making choices, making decisions for ourselves. Why, why at the end of life, when it's so important, is that taken away? And if you, and you know, if you don't want to do that, then just you know, it's not for you. But don't take that choice away for other people. Thank you. We've got one minute to go, so really quickly to Sarah and Zoe, if you had any message for the party leaders. Just like, I would ask them, do you think that the current situation is, is okay? Is it, is it um, acceptable for someone to die a really slow and painful death, screaming in agony? That's what I would like to ask them. I'd like to add just a simple, whose life is it anyway? Yeah, yeah exactly. And I can't top that, and I agree with everyone. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a fantastic point to end today's event on. My huge thanks to all of our speakers. That was just um, incredibly powerful, it was moving, it was motivational, it's re-energised me to go off this afternoon and keep the focus firmly on May the 6th and getting those numbers in favour of assisted dying elected to that parliament on that day. Uh, big thanks to the Dignity and Dying team behind all the logistics of the event, in particular Fran and Francis. Um, thank you to you all so much for coming today. We hugely appreciate it. This is a movement. It takes a, a number of people to join together and really fight to get this law changed. We'll do it together and Definitely. you can find 
all the information you need at Dignity and Dying Scotland's website, um, follow us on Twitter, um, get out there, go out, take up Peter on the, the homework assignment, contact your candidates, tell your story, and together we'll, we'll make the difference. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. 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 Bye.